Hey, everybody, and welcome to this week's Say Report. And I am your host, Sejan Serwick, along with my host companion, Devin Decker. Devin Decker! Here we are. And uh, we wanted to just say really quickly, congratulations to everybody on us hitting two years. Congratulations, everybody. Yeah, everybody. Thank you so much for, like, supporting us as we make this momentous occasion. I mean, you know, they didn't do anything. We did all the work, but yeah, sure. But we should thank them, right? I, what are we stealing this from right now? What What is this bit stolen from? I don't, I don't know. Probably oh, you know every- what it is? You know what it is? It is the Me First and the Gimme Gimme's Ruin Johnny's Bar Mitzvah. <laughs> when they're like, oh, there's a lot of people who traveled a long way to get here today. And we just like to give them a round of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, Me First and the Gimme Gimme's. <laughs> Because, like, they had to travel to play at the bar mitzvah. Uh, yep. Man, that joke is so much better once you explain it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to make sure everybody got it. You know what sucks? You know what sucks about this being uh, two years of the podcast? What? This is a great energy that you're bringing. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it is a, it's meant to be a good energy. It's the fact that, like, two years sort of feels like the least significant accomplishment. <laughs> if you're doing something weekly, because we are only four episodes removed from our hundredth episode, which seems like a much greater accomplishment for sure. Yeah, like oh, your hundred and fourth episode, go fuck yourself. What do you? What do you? What do you think, Johnny like, Carson? It's like celebrating your twenty third birthday. Like hooray! What it means nothing. You're just, you know you still can't drive a car, but also you've been able to drink for two years now. Get over it. Well, you still can't rent a car. You hopefully by twenty three you can drive a car. Oh yeah, right. <laughs> well, but not it's just like one of those things where I'm like, but at the same time, I am really happy that we made it to two years. Mm-hmm. I didn't think this thing was gonna last two weeks. Hey with, man, with look at this. <laughs> no strings on us. We're like Pinocchio. That's a couple of regular old Pinocchios. <laughs> uh, so, so yeah. So as CJ said, this is the same report, and we're just two guys who will talk about anything and everything. And CJ, how have you been in the last week? Are you Anything not you using P- Pinocchio to get us into the the big conversation today? Or I, I mean, like I did want to, but I wanted to I wanted to make sure I gave you your propers before I. I have a lot that I want to talk about this week. Yeah, no, I, I um, uh, pretty good, uh, pretty pretty good week. Devin got 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 a new job. <laughs> oh, you got a new job. Yeah. You're not allowed to talk about it yet, though, right? Well, I, I in 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 some fashions, I am. I probably don't know what details I can and can't go into, but I, I will be working for Netflix. I can say that much. I don't Excellent. know. Excellent. I have an idea for that, a show. Do I pitch that directly to you, or? Uh, yeah. No. Why not? Directly to me. Sure. I don't think I could do anything with it, but you can still pitch it to me. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's about a guy. He's like you know, like he's like one of them '70s guys. And he's traveling across the country running away from something. I don't know what this something is yet. One of those 70s guys? As in he's like 70 years old? Or like Like he's a guy from the 70s? Like David Banner in The Incredible Hulk. Like So like that model of like the helpful stranger. And like he triangles on into town and he helps them with their problems. Because right now it sounds like you're talking to me about a movie about a guy that f- travels through time from the 70s to solve problems here in the future. The worst part is I'm literally just pitching you the the, the like the podcast, man, <laughs> which is something we talked about before. I can't even pitch you something you were there for the inception of. <laughs> I, I, like I said, you've got to really work on your I pitch. Really I don't know what you want from me. Well, you're you're really more the pitch man. I'm the idea man. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I got the I got the new job, and that was that was some good news this week. Um, let's see, what else did I do? I did science today and fixed a, my car key. What? <laughs> did you take pencil lead and rub it off? Uh, it? So I got the so I got the new uh, I got I got the new used car right a couple of weeks ago. Um, and one of the uh, one of the great features that it came with was a key fob so broken that it could not go on to any key ring that I owned. Um, and so it's been, it's been a couple of weeks of me, like frantically looking for my one key every morning because it's not with the rest of my keys on my key ring. Um, and I decided I was sick of that. 
Um, and so today I, uh, I did a little bit of research. My, uh, when my father was actually in town for the holidays, he actually had shown me a couple of really interesting uh, YouTube videos that he's gotten into. He's gotten real deep into the Hot Wheels repair YouTube circuit. Like, it's, a, it's apparently a thing. Um, and he is fascinated by it. Like, he is by all mundane, <laughs> bizarre hobbies that, I don't know. Um, these guys cannot make a YouTube video to save their life, for starters. But that's a, that's a whole other issue. Um, but one of the little tricks that they use is when they're repairing like the plastics and metals is they they use a little bit of a, a a quick fix quick bond thing where they mix super glue and baking soda and it makes like plastic like instantly and my dad being a chemist is like in love with this like little thing that they do so it's all he can talk about you see these hot wheel videos where they make their own plastic it's like yeah i i, I yeah <laughs> i get it dad but sure enough today it came into it came into play because when i went to go fix my key fob i was actually like oh shit you know what i can do <laughs> i can make plastic <laughs> I know how to make super plastic. glue and baking soda. Is your father really a chemist? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, so he, cool. Uh, he was a he was a chemist for um, for twenty some odd years. Worked for Waters Chemical Company, and then uh, that company shipped overseas. And so now he's a chemistry teacher. Um, but he was a uh, but he's he's an actual chemist. Mm -hmm. That's crazy because my dad is a biologist. <laughs> and this is like uh, something <laughs> I never even knew about that. Like we come from scientist stock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and they did something wrong along the way, but yeah, here we are. Yeah, they. I don't know. I mean, I love science, but not enough yeah. to make it my career. I am not good at it. Like, I love science, too, but you actually asked me to explain anything, and it, it, it goes tits up real quick. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so I've been doing that kind of weird stuff with my week as I, I sit here waiting to start the new job at the end of it um but why what do what's up Devin what how do you want to play this well, game well there's a lot of things that I want to talk about first of all I have signed up for the AMC a list right oh. not a sponsor oh. um but it's twenty dollars a month and you can oh. see three movies a week okay <laughs> and this the, is this is like the continuing saga of Devin trying to find a new movie <laughs> home right and the main impetus to me signing up for this is I wanted to see a movie in D-Box. And a <laughs> D-Box ticket, if it's the first showing of the day, is $16. But any yeah. other showing, it is $20. But, right. and here's the thing, if you're on the fence about AMC A-List, here's the thing that's going to change your mind. It includes everything. I can see IMAX, I can see 3D, I can see D-Box at any of over 600 AMC locations across this great nation. That's pretty awesome. That is that is really cool that they that they don't have any stipulations in terms of like what type of theater to go into. And you can see the same movie three times. Nice. I can literally watch Aquaman three times a week until Aquaman is out of the theater. <laughs> um, but... I, I wanted to see a movie in D-Box, and Aquaman was the only one that's been playing in D-Box since Aquaman came out. And I went to buy tickets and saw it was $20. And then to join AMC A-List, it's $20. <laughs> so... So what the hell, right? I signed up for AMC A-List. It's a three-month commitment, so I'm going to yeah. have to see three D-Box movies over the next three months. <laughs> uh, just, like, to guarantee its value, or... If I go up there and I go see, like, two movies every time I go up to that theater, it's only right. half an hour away in Lisbon, Connecticut, I am, I'm, I'm getting my money's worth, right? Yeah, There's no way that it's, it works, and I can't believe how well it works. Like, yeah, the, that's, that's pretty awesome. That, that seems like that's kind of a no-brainer, right? Right. So I saw Aquaman again, and <laughs> that got you off your ass to see Aquaman, if, if memory serves. Yeah, it's not so much got me off my ass, it's just that I got finally, you know, I, I came to the realization that there was nobody out here that was going to go see Aquaman with me. Um, whether it was disinterest or or something more, there were some people out here that are just adamantly just against it. Um, we hate and then, the ocean! Great yeah, Salt yeah, yeah. Lake or nothing! Uh, there's, there, is a, there is a very big... Um, I, if, I don't know how to, I want you I don't to know how say anti-ocean contingent. Those no. are the words I want to come out of your mouth. They're not going to be the words. But if we you said to... there's an anti-ocean contingent in, in, in the middle of Utah, in the middle yeah. of Utah. landlocked Utah. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, the uh, they're like we have all the salt. We don't need anything else. Uh, they uh, 
No, we talked a little bit about this last week. The idea that when people kind of pick sides on a fight, right? And and you know a little bit with um, or maybe this was actually on the ooh the hidden episode. Uh, we'll have maybe I don't remember when the conversation happened, but the idea that like when people get um people pick sides in these movie fights and and they get real adamant about their side, there's very much a. Uh, Marvel um, wave out here, as there is in most places right now. You know, DC is, is fighting an uphill battle, trying to prove itself. Um, uh, time and time again, we we come back to this conversation, but uh, but yeah. So it's been a little bit of a challenge trying to get out there, and and I thought that was a little weird when I was considering that we do have to, you know, we have to give props to Aquaman. This week they they passed the billion dollar mark. It is the most profitable uh, DC movie in the last fifteen years at least, right? Like it's beat every Nolan movie and everything, right? Um. If I if memory serves, am I no, wrong no, no, on that? No, no, you're correct. I was just okay. <laughs> you seemed like you were on a thing, so I didn't want to interrupt. Well, and and that there is a little bit of a caveat with that, I guess I should say. It actually is not doing well domestically. It's actually one of the lowest performing DC movies domestically. Did you know that? No, I did All, not know that. I know yeah, that it's it only one. It's only got about week. two. Yeah, it's only got about two hundred and ninety million dollars domestically, which is actually makes it like it's the fourth or fifth. That's grossing. less than every DC movie since Man of Steel. Yes. Because uh, I've done the math, people. Yeah. Yes. But that being said, it's done well over seven hundred million dollars overseas. Uh China and you know, and then that market, they they fucking they love they love their big flashy American um blockbusters for sure. That's that's always been the case. But uh but apparently that has been what's really carried uh, Aquaman in in the budget stuff. So it's why everybody I think over here has had such a weird reaction to Aquaman, which we have definitely talked about before, is the idea that there are people out there that are like, I, I enjoyed it, but I don't know if this is the movie that we should all be putting our hat on, right? And, you know, um, and so anyway, that is all to say that I ended up finding myself in an empty uh, theater for $8 yesterday on a Sunday evening um, seeing that movie. And sure enough, there was nobody there with me. I was all by my lonesome, which was fun, but like also made it really hard for me to get invested in the movie, I think. Um, but we'll talk a little bit more about that today, like later when we get into the actual thing. Um, but yeah, I got off my ass and I went to go see Aquaman and I've, I've done seen it, but Devin, you've seen it like four or five times now. Right? I've seen it twice. I've only seen it the two times. Um, and one time in D box, which is interesting. <laughs> It's not something I ever have to do again. I don't need to ever see another movie in D-Box. Um, I don't know if this would have been the movie I would have gone to D-Box for. Oh, I don't dude. know. Can I tell you, like, straight up, small, small spoiler for Aquaman. There is a fight on a submarine in the first ten minutes of the movie, and Aquaman does that thing where he picks up the bad guy and slams him between the two small corridor hall, like, walls. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And the D box seat rocked me like I was that dude. Oh God! <laughs> I no, got to feel you. like Aquaman not, was beating me up. That's and not that the feeling awesome. I want. I want to be Aquaman. I don't want to be the dude Aquaman's punching in the face. Uh, okay, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about, and I don't want to be that guy. Oh, it's all, it was so cool because I'm like, oh, I never, I didn't think this experience was gonna be like. Hey, you ever wonder what it feels like to get beat up by Arthur Curry? <laughs> <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> I don't think anybody was thinking that when they created D-Box, for sure. Um, <laughs> yeah. I can almost guarantee it. Um, and the other cool thing is that, like, for most of it, I had my feet firmly planted on the ground. But then right before the Ring of Fire fight, um, I'm like, I'm underwater right now. I'm going to take my feet up and, like, just float. And it <laughs> gave me the sensation of underwaterness. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Oh, jeez. So I would I would never recommend the first viewing of a movie be in D-Box because it's yeah. a little distracting. But yeah, if yeah. it's a movie you've seen, and a step further, if it's a movie you've seen and you love, I would see it in D-Box. I want to see Back to the Future in D-Box. That would be kind of cool. Can I can I ask you D-Box experience? I, I've never... Uh, oh, yeah, all uh, the questions are, are... Any question, ask well, me Well, I've only really got one. D-box. The one thing that's really been interesting me about this is that... um. It reminds me a lot, as somebody that's never done it, it reminds me a lot of going to those, like, 4D experiences at, like, Disney and, and, and Universal. And one of the things about those experiences that always was kind of goofy to me is that you can hear the mechanics of, like, the vehicle you're in working. So it kind of, it, in a way, pulls you out of it. I mean, you're already at only, like, a five-minute-long experience at Disney, right, and after standing in 40 minutes in line. So it's not like you're, like, invested in, in any major way. But... 
in a movie, that'd be very different for me. Like, I feel like, like, can you hear the mechanics of the debugs working? Like, do you just hear, like, like, as you go? Like, no, because, I mean, and maybe it's because you're so invested in the film, but also it's the fact that, like, it's a movie theater, so everything else is louder. Like, those 4D mm. experiences at, like, Disney and stuff, they're yeah. not cranked up because they want to be, like, kid friendly. Right, right, right. So, like, but the movie theater, they don't give a fuck. They're like, yeah, it's to that be as loud to as that possible. Point. I saw Mary Poppins return when it returns with my parents while they were here. We should totally talk about that at some point. But um, but we spent the entire time wondering why there was this really deep, bassy, like, like reverberation through the whole thing. Then, lo and behold, when I went to Aquaman yesterday, I was like, oh, because Aquaman was next door. And every time they do his mind meld thing where he talks to fish and it goes, whoop, 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 whoop. It is such a deep, bassy note that it rocks not just the theater, but every theater around it. <laughs> that happens all the time, though. Like that's yeah. that's not new. Like I could always hear. No, the I'm just saying. Movie that's going for a movie, on. no, you're talking about movie theaters being louder. I'm saying, yeah, to the point where you can actually hear movies in other movie theaters. <laughs> yeah. So there's that thing. So like, and you're immersed in this really weird way. Like it's also like you're sitting on a rumble pack. <laughs> Because, like, this, the chair shakes, too. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So it's it's an interesting experience. Again, I wouldn't recommend it all the time. The weirdest thing about it and the worst thing about the experience was they're just in the middle of the theater. So, like, imagine any movie that you've ever gone seen, right? Right. Yeah. The middle two rows, instead of being regular seats, are D-box seats. <laughs> and those two rows of seats are reserved. Yeah. You reserve your seat there. Right. But there's no, like, indication that they're reserved other than the fact that it's a D-Box seat. So we got there, and, you know, that you have to buy them online or beforehand or pick your seats because it's all automated, right? Right. There's no right. such thing as manual ballast control anymore. <laughs> you buy your ticket, you pick it, and then the fact that there's supposed to be somebody in that seat activates the seat. And okay. the intensity meter is, like, going up and down. It's like playing Pong with itself to right. show you that the seat is active. And then when you sit down, when it feels the weight of a human being, that ceases, and you can begin to adjust your intensity from the four levels wow. of intensity that are available. So, like... You could sit in one assuming that the lights aren't on, right? Because if right. the lights are on, that seat is reserved. But you could sit there otherwise and think. And then and then it won't shake, right? <sighs> it won't shake. It'll just be a regular seat, right? So that's an interesting okay. thing, right? So that we're not totally giving up two rows of seats for this double the price experience. <laughs> right, right. In, in case nobody wants to pay it. Mm -hmm. The problem becomes, well, one of the problems specifically at this theater is the screen where you pick it has the seats go from house right to house left, 1 to 10. But in the actual theater, it goes from 1 to 10, house left to house right. Instead of right to left, it goes left so they to right. screwed up their screen. So <laughs> they did, yeah, they screwed up on the screen, right? Like whoever programmed the screen programmed it wrong. Or they screwed up in the theater because, like, the number should have gone the other way. <laughs> Jeez. Right? Okay. So it's like, so you have, like, so we reserved the two middle seats, but we left a seat in between because it was our first time doing it. Dale ended up coming with me. And we want, we didn't know how close the seats were to each other, like the mm -hmm. D-Box seats. Right, and we right. didn't want that to affect it. We wanted to feel like what it would be like if you were alone doing it, which, yeah. like, that was a gamble, right? Because what if that seat between what if us somebody, was yeah, there? What if, so what if somebody was just like, I'm taking that seat. <laughs> so that didn't happen. Well, for thank, the family, I guess. Thank God. But there were people, like, the two end seats were reserved on both okay. sides. Like, they were both activated. And people came and sat in those seats. And then right before the movie started, someone else came in and was like, you're in our seats. That's one and two. We reserved one and two. And it's like, yeah, but not based upon the thing. So those people had to go all the way around to the other seats. But people were already seated in those seats who did not reserve them. So it was this whole, like, push and move around. 
because of that issue with the screen uh, to the theater. I, I'm surprised that I mean I guess D box has become ubiquitous enough that they can't really afford to do this, but I'm I'm surprised that there are not ushers specifically for that sort of incident. You know what I mean? Like I agree. I 100 percent agree that it's like you have one usher on, and this theater isn't like a freaking showcase cinema, right? Which right. like now I'm being more vocal at this point. I don't give a fuck. You know I don't like them, but mm -hmm. like where on a Saturday night they have maybe one usher available. <laughs> And yeah. For the entire theater. Because, right. like, they run at bare minimum. So, like, you're not going to be able to find an usher. This is a place that, like, four or five ushers running around cleaning their 12 theaters. Because, right. like, they can afford it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know how AMC does it. But, like, you see it and it's like, oh, I really feel like it could be done. Like, I feel like if I had a problem, I could go get an usher. Right. Because, like, I'm always told if you have an issue, go get an usher, right? Like, they're like, if you're having those problems, go get an usher. Why don't you get an usher? And it's like, because a lot of the times, I can't find the one usher. The one guy that you have on today to solve problems is nowhere near me or this theater, so. So, so I'm just going to, like, try to solve it on my own or ignore it. Yeah. Like, it's it's just weird. That's just a weird thing that I've noticed. But But then, a guy comes in. The movie has been on for 10 minutes. Ugh, right? Yeah, yes. This guy comes in and Ugh. flashlight on his phone on trying to find his D-Box seats. And there are people seated in them. He's like, you're in my seats! And they're like, we paid for these. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> these oh are the seats we paid God. for. Them. So he's like, well, I'm getting... Ah, ah. So he's just sitting there with his light on. A guy in the back goes, sir, shut your flashlight off. <laughs> and he marches out and then an usher comes back and the usher has like the big flashlight but by the time like the girl's like we're just gonna move like it's not worth it for this like we didn't pay we're just gonna move our seats yeah so I mean they had paid for the experience but like someone else had paid for them if that mm -hmm. makes sense like like, yeah, if, yeah, like yeah. if your mom bought your ticket right right so right, they're right. like we don't care whatever <laughs> We'd, we'd rather Wasn't our avoid money. the incident. Right, exactly. Deal with this guy. So, but like that, like, first of all, if you're going to pay for this thing that's like double the price of the ticket, how are you not getting there on time? And it's not like there was one trailer Aquaman. No, right. There were like nine trailers. <laughs> yeah, it was actually part of my timing issue last night was that the trailers were 40 minutes long on the movie I went to. So I was at that theater 40 minutes later than I, I, I had figured for some trailers, but I did not plan on an almost an extra hour added to my movie experience. <laughs> like, so like, so that dude was like half an hour late to his movie. Oh, and God. then he's acting all like entitled, like there has to be a statute of limitations, right? And right. I'd like to believe that even if there were an usher, like applied to D-Box, they would have left at the <laughs> point where it's like, everybody who's doing this is sat down. <laughs> I mean, it, it's 20 minutes into this movie. I think it's okay if I go now. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> like, so it was just weird. Um, but yeah, so Aquaman is something that we're finally going to get to talk about because I loved it. And I don't know how Seijin felt about it. <laughs> I... I mean, like, okay, so not wait, to just completely from this take... moment forward, spoilers for Aquaman, hardcore. Yeah. If you haven't seen it, I need you to check something for me real quick before we go into this. Yes. Um, did the upside beat it? And if so, by how much? So, like, oh, hit so... boxofficemojo.com. <laughs> because I'm very curious. Yeah, I actually honestly didn't realize it came out, the upside came out this weekend, so I'd be very, no. Uh, no. No, it didn't. Oh, it totally did. I'm sorry. I'm reading the wrong one. I was reading about how Aquaman tops, not the box office, but tops the DC box office. Right, which people we already just... said. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. But uh, people are purposely putting misleading headlines out there right now to try this. Ugh, I hate that shit. Uh, no, uh, Upside Beats Aquaman. Um, replicas bombed. Oh, poor Keanu Reeves. Although I don't think that that movie was ever meant to, meant to make a ton of movie, money. Oh, that's why they um... released it in January. <laughs> Against the I, upside. All I can see is that. Yes. The upside. No, the upside made twenty million, but they're not talking about what Aquaman actually made. Hold on. Uh, twelve million. So okay. it's a, it's a pretty hefty amount. That's a pretty hefty amount. That's eight million dollars. 
I mean, but but to be fair, Aquaman's been out for a month now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it yeah. was it was number one for three weeks, three weeks in a row. Um, I just didn't expect the upside to be the one to kick it out. And the thing I'd like to talk about before we get to Aquaman, everybody knows how I feel about the upside. I'm going to see it this week. Um, mm-hmm. I need to be scarce. Like there's events going on at the house. So I'm going to go see the upside, even though I have really no desire to. Um, but maybe I'll be pleasantly surprised, right? Going in with zero expectations, minus yeah. two. Um, a lot of people giving it Oscar buzz on my Twitter. And I know that like you cultivate what you see on Twitter. It's one of the nastiest parts about social media. But I could not believe all the people calling that this movie deserves an Oscar. After the conversation we had about, like, I think it's weird that it's a remake of a movie that nobody knows about. Yeah, yeah. But we did also then have that same conversation where this is just going to be a weird year for awards. So I honestly, I am out of this this guessing game. Like, maybe, sure, Upside comes in and takes it all. That'd be a really weird year for everybody to talk about for years to come. Don't know why Chadwick Boseman didn't get nothing, but uh, but Kevin Hart won that Oscar for the Upside. Did you see that? <laughs> Yep. Like, speaking I don't know, of, man. Speaking of a weird year for awards, and to really kick us into the Aquaman conversation, who do you think did a better job playing a long lost mother? Michelle Pfeiffer or Nicole Kidman? Oh, I think Nicole Kidman did a fantastic job in this movie, but I think Michelle Pfeiffer was a much more interesting character to me. Yeah. I, so, like, I, 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 like in the end, I think it's almost not fair to compare Nicole Kidman's character to her because, as much as you can, story-wise, actual like screen time and, and importance to like the story. Because the other thing is, is that Nicole Kidman pops back up in that movie and really doesn't do anything. Like she, like when she shows yeah. back up, it doesn't really change Arthur's plan at all. It doesn't, it doesn't change really anything. <laughs> Like, oh, also there's one more person in this movie still. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> yeah. 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 Because um, that's what I was thinking of. Because I'm like, it's cool that Michelle Pfeiffer's in this movie. And I'm like, no, wrong Batman. And I'm like, right, <laughs> Batman Forever. Which I'm, I'm going to go on record. I wanted to go on record. Batman Forever is my favorite non-Christopher Nolan Batman movie. Fight me. I, it's, a, it's a pretty decent one. I mean, it's hard for me to, to deny the, what is it, 86? Is that the one? 89. With the 89? Yeah, I mean, it's, 89 it's hard. 89 is really, really good. But I think that Batman Forever is the one that, like, hit the, the chord of what came before and what they were trying to do in a really nice way. I really like the way that they use Harvey Dent to introduce Robin. Like, that whole, yeah, that whole like, subplot I think is really good. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, it's, I, I love I Batman Forever, man. Really You're not going to get it me. With, yeah. um, with Bruce Wayne. I think mm-hmm. that Bruce Wayne is a big part of the Batman story. And up until that point, Bruce Wayne was just kind of like given a scene or two. But I think that Val Kilmer really got to like be Bruce Wayne. Well, I, I think it's pretty common, pretty common hell belief that that like Kilmer was a really good Wayne, not necessarily that was Batman. Clooney was a good Batman, not necessarily the best Wayne. But then like Michael Keaton kind of nails them both. The thing is, is you're right. The way that they use Bruce Wayne in those first two movies, he's very much is like he's basically just Batman in waiting, right? Like yeah. every time, every time you see Bruce Wayne, he looks like he's two seconds away from running to the fucking fireman's pole to get down to the bat cave to put on his costume. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's like Michael Keaton. You can move your neck right now. You don't have the cowl on. Yeah, you don't have the cowl on. It's cool, bro. No, don't, don't glower. Don't glower. Bruce Wayne doesn't glower. <laughs> Bruce Wayne is like fun loving and a good time. Oh uh, man. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. For sure. So that's just, um, it's just one of those things that I thought of considering it's DC movies and the fact that like both of them have been a Batman like lady mm-hmm. <laughs> and then that they both sort of played that weird same role mm-hmm. but like Michelle Pfeiffer as Janet Van M- Michelle Pfeiffer as Janet Van Dyne it like changes the course of Ant-Man and the Wasp in yeah, a way and, that and, like even and honestly, the, the, the five DC, uh, the Marvel universe like from yeah. here on out like yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where, like, the five-year-old kid sitting behind us is like, I knew that was coming. (laughs) (laughs) And it's like, your dad doesn't know how to get to the movies on time, but, you know. (laughs) Well, yeah, that's that's also the other thing, is everybody keeps, and this is just a DC problem, that the writing in in the DC movies has still not 
quite gotten there yet um out in the in the new universe in the snyderverse right is is that there's this there was never a moment where we didn't believe she was alive and that was never more apparent than everybody talking about how dead she was <laughs> Right. Like Willem Dafoe says it like three times. We hear uh, we hear Patrick Wilson talk about it. We dude, hear Mira talk dude, about it. Dude, Amber so, talk about it. Aquaman's character up to the point where she is revealed alive is like she's dead because of me. You can say yes. other lines. She's mm-hmm. dead because of me. <laughs> no, no, no. Other things are happening <laughs> that we watch. My mother is dead because of me. <laughs> Well, and that's also really weird because they they literally stake so much of his personality on it. Like his stakes are that he feels like responsible for his mother's death and he can't ever let that happen again, which is why he does not want to be a hero. And they just rip the rug out from under him by being like, no, your mom's not dead, bro. So like this whole attitude that you've cultivated around the fact that you blame yourself for your mother's death is just nothing now. So like... I don't know who the Snyder verse Aquaman is if he is not the Arthur Curry who blames himself for his mother's death. He doesn't know who he is. Right, right. But that's what I mean. It's like this whole movie, the character that they actually – I don't think they did a great job introducing me to. But, 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 but you know, let's put that conversation aside for a second. The character that they introduced me to is not going to be the character from here on out. So they spent two and a half hours showing me this Aquaman that is not going to be the Aquaman that I now follow for the rest of the DC universe. Like, great job. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah, but I, 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 um, yeah, it's something that I didn't really notice until the second time where I'm like, wow, you talk about your mom a lot. Well, and it's like, true all around. It also, his whole, like, I don't ever want to go back to Atlantis. Well, now at the end of this, he seems to be very accepting of that. His whole, like, I don't want to be part of that, be part of my life. He seems very accepting of that. Like, <laughs> like everything that we set him up to be at the beginning of that movie, he, and like, I'm all for character growth. That's great. It's just, now I don't know what to, I have no idea where they go next. And maybe that's a good thing because it's Aquaman and, and they don't maybe don't know where they go next because it's not like there's a bunch of like like um, Aquaman stories that are in everybody's heart, right? Like he's not this character that everybody has like their favorite Aquaman story for. I'm just – I don't know who he is. Like I – what's the point in going back and watching Justice League? What's the point in watching this movie again if, if I know that this is not going to have any bearing on the rest of – Aquaman. Well, I mean, it, I don't think I think that's also sort of the thing is that in a real weird way, Aquaman is supposed to act as this reboot to the entire Snyderverse. Yeah, they I don't think want he, I, you yeah. to go back and watch yeah. Justice League ever again. Yeah. The fact yeah. that they reference Justice League in one line of dialogue, line, the whole movie yeah. is like, like that was a we think that was a mistake. I would not be surprised if that doesn't exist in the DVD release. Why and no not one but use... me notice it? Right. Why not use what happened in Justice League, the fight between Batman and Superman, for the Atlanteans to be like, look at what the people on the surface have become. Why have that? Why they they spend no time talking about this? It is for people that are so invested, like Patrick Wilson, and for all of his investment in trying to make the uh, the people upstairs look bad. Why did he never once bring up the fact that like humans almost just destroyed the entire world because of their their greed between Lex Luthor and Bruce Wayne being an idiot and Clark Kent for all intents and purposes being an adopted human like not doing not being much better himself right like like it's just such a weird thing they had such a great thing that they could anchor to Justice League but you're right I think you're uh, they they don't want you to think about Justice League so they just ignore it for this entire film yeah. Yeah, it's it's crazy. It is the craziest thing about this film. Like what I said, like I was asked by a friend, do I need to see Justice League before Aquaman? And I'm like, I haven't seen Aquaman yet. It doesn't come out for a week. But let me <laughs> tell you, no. Yeah. They don't want you to the, Justice League what is what yeah. is how they're approaching this film. <laughs> and it's and it's real it's really awkward. In yeah, a lot it's of very... ways. I mean, Patrick Wilson's character, I think all he wants is to be called Ocean Master. Mm-hmm. And I he doesn't, he, all he wants is the title. I He's just, like, just call me that. I don't I don't want to actually do anything with it. I just want to be Ocean Master. It just sounds so cool being the Ocean Master. And also, we have not talked at all about this movie, and I'm okay with that. But there's that scene where they're at like the meeting place of the kings. 
And it's uh-huh. like, you need the support of four of the seven kingdoms, and three of them are dead. It's like, so then you adjust that, right? <laughs> like, that's how democracy how does, works. How does, that, how does that law still stand? Yeah. What happens if another kingdom falls? Is everything just fucked from here on out? Okay, like, so like... Now, now we can never fight the, uh, the surface. And, yep. like, the surface is the reason why those other two fell. Like, I'll be I'll be entirely honest though that that scene in which Patrick Wilson just basically opens his mouth and just exposition just comes falling out I was completely glazed over it was so hard for me to follow exactly what was going on like there was no graphics it was just Patrick Wilson floating around with his hair being all wavy like <laughs> the, the 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 vocalization thing that they did on everybody underwater did not do it for me in a post Bane world how dare they like like with all the fucking problems that that DC has had in the past with like hey we couldn't understand this one character they went out of their way to make like half of their fucking movie almost incomprehensible at least to my ear like it was just like uh, and i was like what is happening (laughs) so like he's trying to explain all of the story that you need because they don't do anything to give you any history before this like there's no exposition besides there's the stuff about his parents but like we have no idea why she's running away we have no idea what she's even running from like it was just crazy how little they were willing to give me as if as if they wanted me to just be like it's aquaman i know this story you like you don't have to tell me peter parker's origin again i don't need to see uncle ben die no i need to see aquaman <laughs> i need to know why aquaman is like this this character and why he's not in atlantis and why like atlantis might actually be in like trouble <laughs> like it was crazy how much they just assumed i either knew or didn't care to know because i wanted to know more i really did it was crazy if it's one of the others they assumed that you didn't care yeah, yeah, like yeah. he's Aquaman. He talks to fish. Next, yeah, no, but, but like see? I need more and, than that. Next, and I can respect that. I I can I can respect that idea that 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 they needed to make it. They needed to make a a decision, right? Either they go whole hog in and trying to sell as Aquaman, or they could just be pretentious as hell and just pretend that no, this is an Aquaman movie. You already paid your ticket price. Deal with it. And I think that they went more with the latter. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely, definitely. They're like he talks to fish. Next. Mm-hmm. There's an ocean kingdom next. Deal with it next. Also, uh, back to the ocean master thing, real quick. I laugh he does every time. But he does actually become o- like ocean master is the title that he has in the comics, isn't it? Yes, Orm is the ocean master. Right. That so is, like that's the title that he has. But but this movie specifically laid out these rules in order to be deemed ocean master. So like he can't now ever be ocean master. Right. Unless he's like, I claim the title for my own. Well, here's the thing, right? Well, and Arthur Kern's not going to be like, no. Sure, fucking call yourself the Ocean Master. At least, at least, yeah, like, at least the Arthur Curry they introduced you to. Like, <laughs> you can call yourself whatever you want. I don't care. It don't mean nothing. <laughs> right. I um, laughed. Um, there is a scene in Hackers. <laughs> and I love Hackers. I don't, I'm sorry that, like, it's become oh, my God. thing. But there is a scene in Hackers where Dade Murphy has just made it so uh, Agent Gill is deceased. Like, he changed his personnel record to show that he died. Right. And he is given one point, and it ties him and Angelina Jolie's scores. <laughs> and so they have to up the bet. Which doesn't make any sense. This is a scene in Hackers that makes no sense. And that's why it relates perfectly to Aquaman. You mean like every scene in Hackers, but sure, keep going. But this scene specifically makes no sense. Because the bet is still who can do more to this poor guy, right? (laughs) It doesn't... Yes, they're tied right now. So now someone needs to do something else, right? Mm -hmm. It goes until there's no further place to go or you're at a stalemate. But they're like, all right, so we need to up the stakes because you both scored 60 points. And it's like, I guess, okay. That's how bets <laughs> worked in the 90s. Yeah, so, okay. So they up the stakes, and he's like, all right, so when we go on our date, if I win, you have to wear a dress. <laughs> and Lord Nikon, Paul Cook, I can't think of Lawrence. Oh, I can't think of his last name. Um, Santioli or something like that. The, the, the like, older dude. Who calls himself Lord Nikon? He is because he has a photographic memory. He laughs 
from off screen. And it is this like iconic laugh of just like, that's so fucking absurd what you just said. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, And, like, I don't know, watching it in 2019, if that laugh is because this girl will never wear a dress or because we're supposed to be upping the stakes. Yeah, <laughs> it, it almost makes me wonder if it was not an intended laugh. Like, maybe he didn't know that line was coming for some reason or another. Yeah. And it was actually and literally like, just him just laughing at the line that just came out of that dude's mouth. Well, yeah, but then, like, because the other thing is that Angelina response is, yeah, but if I win, so do you. So it's like, all right, so the initial bet of if if he wins, you go on a date together. If she wins, you become her, like, slave, her cyber slave doing, like, grunt work for hacking. Like, that's done, right? Because she has just admitted, no matter what, you two are going on a date. Right now, the stakes of your bet are lower than they were before because one of you has to wear a dress on the date. <laughs> and at the very end of the movie, it looks like they're both wearing dresses. <laughs> but they talk about how he won. <laughs> but... Like this is this is off topic kind of, but watching Aquaman a second time. Yes. The first time I saw it, every time he said Ocean Master, I wanted to laugh. Uh -huh. Because of just like he says it so seriously, but it's such a stupid fucking title. You have all these Devin, I have to tell you, that's how I felt about everything in this movie is so everybody is so fucking self-serious so for like there's never a moment where they step back and go but this is aquaman right like like you brought up ant-man earlier so i'll use that as the as the marvel counter example there is so much in that in those movies both of those movies where like yeah this is great this is an awesome superhero movie but also let's take a moment to remember that this is an ant-man movie right not this is not captain america this isn't thor this is fucking ant-man and there was never that moment in, in any aspect at any level in this movie was there ever a moment where we step back to just be like but Aquaman, right? <laughs> like I will, can, I will counter with the fact when it looks like the biker guys are gonna beat him up in the very beginning, and then he pulls out a glittery pink cell phone and asks for a selfie. That is the one moment where they're like, "How fucking absurd is it that we're making an Aquaman movie right now?" Sure, I like, sure, but that's I them. Will concede that moment, but yes. that is them shaking their sillies out to tell one of the most self-serious stories. To date in the DC EU. I will unite the seven kingdoms and get the one ring to rule them all. No, wait, the one trident to rule them all. <laughs> he don't even care about the trident. No, he doesn't. Like, he just cares about the fucking the title. Crazy, that's, cares that's about. a really crazy thing. I, I I am saying all of this, right? It sounds like I'm I love Aquaman. I would watch it right now. That being said, it is absurd. It is absurd that there exists this trident of immeasurable power and status, and, like, he does not have someone investigating it. Oh, my God. Imagine if he had gone for it and failed the test. And so he just, at this point, had just given up on that. But that had, imagine if that had been part of his background. Like, how much cooler would that have been if this idea of he was like, like, I went through and I did not pass that trial, right? Like, when I, like, when I went looking for this thing, it just wasn't going to happen. And so if I can't do it, then no one can, right? Like, like he honestly believes, well, I couldn't even do it, so I guess that means it's lost forever, right? Like, it would have been a so, so much more impressive to see Arthur then be able to pull it off, and so much more of a flip, because and you there know is how never easy a it moment... is to do that? It's yeah, so yeah. easy to do that, where, like, my mother took me to claim the trident, right? Yeah. yeah. And I failed, and she died so that I could escape. I mean, like, there's, yeah, and right? And then you and, also have that, like, he has a guilt, too, about losing their mother. Yes. Yeah, I, I gotta be honest. Also, part of this was informed by the conversations that we had comparing it to, like, Black Panther and stuff beforehand. There's been a lot of stuff in the water about the idea that there is a lot of similarities between the two, and there are. Um, but the thing that got me the most is, as I was watching this movie, is I don't think there's ever a point in which I feel like Orm is a good guy just doing what he thinks is right. You know what I mean? I do. Like, I know exactly like, what like you the mean. Like, the comparison to, to a Killmonger type, 
of being this guy that is doing the wrong things, but for the right reasons. And he is so in his, you know, he is so wrapped up in his convictions that he makes these, these terrible choices, but really to him, they are the only possible right choices. Like there's never that moment for Orm. Like the entire time he does like he, and he just gets progressively worse. Like he starts off as kind of snarky. And then the next thing you know, he's a freaking mass murderer out of nowhere. He just starts murdering other people. And it's just like, Oh, okay. That this is the level that we've gone to with this character. So when we finally get to the end and it is revealed that unlike in black Panther, we are actually going to allow this dude to have this redemption story from here on out. I don't think I want that. You know what I mean? Like when Killmonger makes the decision at the end of Black Panther to 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 die rather than live, you know, in prison, imprisoned in Wakanda, like it hurt my heart. Like when that moment happened, there was legitimately this moment where I was just like, oh, God, this could have this is such an ugly end to such a beautiful like character. Like in this movie, when they offered him the the chance at redemption and they were just like, yeah, we're going to keep you alive and we're going to figure out what to do with you. I was just like no guys you don't have to do this like there's no reason to he has in front of everybody murdered tons of innocent people like not even in a war a war that he started not even a war that he believes or it was just it's crazy that they try to make him a redeemable character <laughs> well and, and so of course i had read that article too that you sent over that it's black panther with the right ending because i'm like i'm gonna see it again i need to read this article and seeing it again, I'm like, to compare Eric Killmonger to Orm is stupid. It's the dumbest thing. Because even further than that is the fact that, like, once his mother comes, she's like, it's not your fault. It's your dad's fault. You, none of this is your fault, sweetheart. Right. It's because your dad told you to wage war on the surface. You were misguided. We're going to fix you. And it's yeah. like, no, 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 that's not what this story was. Yeah, there was at never. All. There yeah. was never. And I'm like, this is awkward. And then, like, he gives that, like, little, like, smile when Arthur says, make sure he has a view. That he's like, oh, oh, he listens. Well, <laughs> yeah. Like, and then, and, you know, yeah, like, there's, a, there's an acknowledging moment between him and Arthur when Arthur says, uh, you know, when you're ready, we can talk. And 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 there's this moment in my head where I was just like Thor and Loki, right? Like like that that kind of relationship, and that definitely is something that we see. But but the thing in Thor and Loki that we are dealing with is the fact that Loki is an immortal god. There really isn't much more they can do with him except keep him in prison in Asgard, right? Like there isn't a next step that they can go to without it being so extreme that we're talking about throwing off the balance of the all of all of the the worlds, right? That isn't true here. Like there's no reason to not execute him. There's no reason to not. It's very bizarre. It's very very bizarre that this is this is where they choose to go with this story. And I have no doubt in my mind that. That they're going to try and do something to the effect of a Loki-ish story with him in the in the next, you know, this will not be the last thing that we see of Orm. At least, if we, Maybe. if it is, well, if it is, then this is an even weirder ending. Let's be honest. Yeah, that's the thing is, I don't think we're going to see Orm again. I 100 percent think this is the end of Orm because of, <coughs> excuse me, the uh, the fact that the the sting. Is Black Manta and Dr. Steven Shin teaming up? Right, right. It's like, that's Aquaman too. Is those two together yeah. eventually joining the Legion of Doom? That has also already somehow been established. Like, I don't remember what movie ended with. Um, They're on the boat? Yeah, with a death stroke. It's a uh, Batman v Superman, is, is the one that ends with Luther on the boat. And no, then no, 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 no. Batman v Superman. Ends with him oh, with him in prison. prison. Yeah, so no, you're right. So it had to be Justice, Justice League. League. Right. We, yeah, okay, we should okay. join. A, we should form a league of our own. Isn't that what they they, they yeah. say? Is and that the joke? Like, that, and yeah. it's like, what the f like? I was trying to think. I'm like, that's not going to be referenced at all in this movie. Like that scene that made no fucking sense at the end of Justice League. <laughs> like, yeah. if it had been, uh, I don't know. Like again, I enjoyed Aquaman, but. But, like, now that I'm actually going over it with a fine-tooth cone, uh -huh. I don't know why. <laughs> 
Well, that and that's and that's exactly the the critique that I gave it when I walked out of that theater yesterday. Is that like I I enjoyed my time with it. It was really fun. It's the second you start thinking about anything in it, it starts to really fall apart. But the great thing about an Aquaman movie is you don't have to think about it that hard. Like from here on out, like they, whatever. Like I would love to see Aquaman too. I will love. I would. I cannot wait for him to show up in other movies. You know, like I've got no problem. Let's talk about the good stuff. Like let's talk about the good things that happen in this movie. Like I really think that 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 Jason Momoa as um as Aquaman as Arthur has been continuously a surprisingly awesome pick. I think that he pulls off the version that they are trying to do of Aquaman. I think he does it better than probably anybody else could have. You know, this this idea of this kind of goofier, you know, hard drinking like uh, biker type Aquaman that you know, for good or for ill, it comes out of out of, it's not like it comes out of nowhere. It is something that has been in the comics since at some point. Like it's good stuff. Like and I okay, like I think he does a great job handling that. I think that side characters steal this movie. Honestly, I think that the two best characters in this movie are Nicole Kidman's uh uh Atlanta Atlanta how do you say her name? Atlanta. Atlanta. So <laughs> Atlanta. it's Atlanta without, without the, the second the T. T. Yeah, so Atlanta, I think that she does a, a really um, she does a really good job making me invested in their story, and honestly, that's kind of what carries me through the whole movie. Is is because as we said earlier, it's pretty obvious she's not dead. So waiting for her to come back and wanting to know if she's ever going to get back to the surface to see her husband is like a huge thing, and you know, and that, and that has a really good story to it. And I think Black Manta, I think that uh, uh, Yaya uh, Abdul, uh, Mon I'm not going to remember his last name. Um, but the dude that they got to play him uh, is just so – he is such a good villain. And so he knows exactly what he's doing, I think, every moment, which is, like – which is really comforting to, like, see him just be just this just, just evil asshole. And honestly, he had the best moment in the movie for me, laugh-wise, when he's building his helmet. He gets the whole montage. Like, we learn more about his origin. We get to see the superhero movie. But it's actually his movie, right? Like, like we don't get to see Aquaman building a suit. We don't get to see Aquaman discovering his powers. When we meet him, he knows them all already. Even in the flashbacks, they don't bother focusing on any of the real training. All they ever really do is just show him having those conversations and him talking about his mother being dead again. But Black Manta, we get, like, we get this entire movie that is his origin story. And we get to see him fail. And now we get to see him, you know, the idea that he will be back and he will be stronger and he will be better. Like, I'm excited to see more of that character, right? As you should Not, be because yeah, yeah. his is also, like, I can't believe I haven't mentioned it yet. The whole story of, like... That's how Arthur learns that your actions have consequences is awesome. Like, that's one of the, the most compelling parts of this film. Yeah. First of all, that fight in Sicily is fucking amazing. Yeah. That whole I... action sequence in Sicily is fantastic. But oh, what's better? Thing, right? yeah. yeah. But what's better is that, like, he had, he created that villain. And, like, mm -hmm. we've seen that before. Like, that has become a trope of superhero films at this point. Is that the hero creates their their villain? They're, yeah, but they're like, big bad. Yeah. But it has never been more apparent than with "I left your father to die, and you blame me for that." Well, and I and and like I looked you in the eye and basically was like, "Deal with it." Like you know, in in Batman eighty nine, as we talked about earlier, like he creates the Joker. It's the first time that that's really ever introduced as a concept in the Batman universe. But like the idea that he drops him in the in the in in the acid and he then that's who becomes the joker and all this shit and there's a there's clearly a moment where he's trying to save him so when the joker comes back and, and is who he is and he feels guilt we we don't think he should feel guilty he's the hero of our movie we saw him try to save him and it just didn't work he, like, it's okay batman it's okay you tried but like in this movie there's a very dark second there where he looks this dude in the eye and is just like, you know, you guys got yourself into this mess. You're on your own getting out. And then just walks out on these two dudes about to fucking die in this okay, submarine. But I did want to talk about the order of operations in that. Mm -hmm. When it is just his father hurt and him with him and he goes, the sea, ask the sea for mercy. You got into this mess. Get out of it on your own and goes to leave. That is not bad. It is that their response to him is shooting and damaging the ballast of the submarine. 
Mm-hmm. And then once it escalates to the Black Manta's father being pinned under a torpedo, he doesn't intervene. Like, I have no problem with that first time as the submarine is going down, him being like, you killed innocent people, you'll ask the sea for mercy, get yourselves out of the situation you created, is not bad. Like that, yeah, that's no, not bad. but it's the moment when there's that when that dude is stuck underneath this torpedo, there is no way that he is getting out. And that and his and son literally turns to Arthur and, like, you and says, You to have help to. Me. Like, yeah, and he just it's... walks away. And that's the thing, though, is that like he has that moment where he considers it and he's like, No, but I just said that real cool thing. I have to go. Yeah, I kind of have to stick to my like, guns on this one. Sorry, man. Like, that was cool what I said, and also not bad. You escalated the situation because he did. Like, because if they, their ship was apparently at the other end of the corridor, <laughs> so like oh, yeah. he leaves, they go about their day, and both of them live. If his father didn't try to shoot him, oh, well, of course, uh, no, it's, like, it's, it's yeah, like, it's this weird thing where I'm like, oh, he said it that early. I thought he said the you asked the sea for mercy thing after the torpedo was on his dad. No, yeah. that's not the case at all. He says it at a point where, like, both of them could have lived if they didn't try to then kill Aquaman after he basically showed them mercy. Because he didn't know that their ship was attached to the same room at the end of the hallway. <laughs> right, right. It's, it's, I don't know, it's, like, strange. Because I was like, that was the scene I was most looking forward to re-watching. And then seeing how the things happen, I'm like, he's still a jerk, right? He still created the Black Manta by not offering him his help when he needed it most. And after he pleaded for him to help him. And his response was, no, screw you. So, um, but, spe- while we're in this conversation, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Yeah, no, but that's the thing. So it's like, yeah, and he also while didn't we're... need to blow himself up. Like, he no. blew himself up with a thermal grenade. Well, That's I think the idea Aquaman's was that was better fault. than drowning. <laughs> I think it was It's that better to be die the... with freedom than live no. in bondage. Oh, God. Uh, no, my question... So here's where here's where things get, might get a little sticky for a second, though, with the Black Manta stuff. Um, how uh, How is he able to stab him with his knife? What do you mean? Later on at the end of the oh, movie, we because... see him pull the knife out and stab him in the, in the arm with it. But he stabs but... into the open wound. I was all about that. Uh, I was all bothered by that. Okay. He has Atlantean Seal, which can stab him. And I got to tell you, I don't want to talk about it here. But someone out there wrote, how is it that Arthur Curry has tattoos if he cannot be hurt by human metal? Like, it needs to be Atlantean Seal. And I did research into your skin and how many layers of skin you have. You have nine layers of skin. Right. And, like, you stain the lower dermis. And it's, like, it makes perfect sense that, like, human steel can cut, like, through the first five layers of skin. But then it's stopped by the harder lower layer. I'll be honest. I thought Orm gave him. I mean, not Orm. I thought um, uh, Willem Dafoe there. Um, gave him I the thought, tattoos that way. Which I, is another I perfect explanation training. of it. Yeah, I, um, because it seemed to be growing with his training through the through the uh, memories and stuff. So I just assumed that and was I, part and that, of and that, So So all my research to it was after I had seen it the one time. And yeah. like I actually did research on our skin as an organ and how and tattooing works. And yeah, I'm yeah, like, yeah. no, it's completely believable that like the top layers can be done. It's the lower layers that aren't. But then watching it the second time, for most of the movie, I thought, no, 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 yeah, it's it's these tattoos are an Atlantean thing, and he is getting them from Volko. But then at the very end, his father has the same tattoos, hmm. and those tattoos are a product of the human side of him. Yeah, they're how yeah. he is closer to his father is having that tattoo. So it's still completely believable that like it can stain through those top five layers of skin. And then sit in the sixth layer, yeah. not going further. But yeah. then how he stabs him later is he takes the Atlantean sword and he jabs it into his left shoulder. And then at the end, he takes it and he sticks that knife into an open wound. That's fantastic. And they really should have made more of a point of making that clear because yeah, no, because that is a that is a beautiful idea that that is something that he can do that. And I think yeah. that's the thing that really works for me about Aquaman, despite all this 
all these like bigger picture stuff, it crumbles to the ground. Is that when it comes to like the small friggin' details, stuff like that exists. Yeah. Yeah, no, like, yeah, we should, like I said, we should focus on some of the good stuff. Like, I really enjoyed a lot of the side characters. I really enjoy a lot of, like, the, the, the ideas, the concepts. It's when stuff starts to come together that it gets a little weird. But man, like the entire I- the idea that he goes through um, the uh, the trench and ends up with this like Cthulhu like elder god, right, conversing with him, and this thing is like just playing with its food essentially until it realizes that he can actually understand it, which was really cool. And like there there was there there's again a really interesting concept there that I really really loved. Um, and the idea that he now has this thing as like a as like a an ally was really cool when it comes back at the end as well. And and I'm interested to see how they play with that in the future. So that was really interesting. Yeah, it's one of those things that like my favorite part about that is that you see the pile of bones for other people who have tried to get the trident and failed. And it's mm-hmm. like my favorite thing is to think that that creature talked to all of them the way that it talked to Arthur. But mm-hmm. they just couldn't understand it. Right. So it's just like, oh, this thing is delightfully mad. Mm-hmm. Like, it has been yeah. driven delightfully mad. Yeah, it, it's just, it's just this, it's like a cat, like, toying with a mouse before it goes to eat it. It's just talking to it, and then it's just going to swallow it whole. Yeah. And then also, yeah, Arthur talks back. Jerry and like, talks, and it's like, wait, you can talk? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> um,. Yeah, see, so, like, like, there's definitely tons of that stuff. I like the idea that he gets his armor at the end from the, the old king. Yeah. yeah. Well, we see it fall off of the body of the old king, right? Well, we see the body of the old king Thanos away. So he doesn't get it. It comes from the trident, the armor. I don't think I'm that pretty sure that you watch it fall. I'm pretty sure that you watch it fall to the ground with the body turning to dust inside it. That's at what least I'm the saying. gloves. But I don't true. think I don't think he then puts it on. That'd be weird. I'm think, pretty sure that's exactly no, what he gross. does. I'm grossed out by that. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that's exactly what he does. <laughs> yeah, you know, whatever. It's cool. I like to believe it's like Green Lantern armor. And they're like, you know what people hated about Green Lantern? His suit was part of his weapon. We're gonna do it in Aquaman. We're gonna and do no one's same gonna thing complain. Here. Yeah. Um yeah man. I like like I I I don't know how I feel about the tech for Atlantis. And there's one there's one thing in particular that keeps sticking in my mind about it is they keep talking about how far advanced Atlant- Atlantis is and how it advances faster than humans because of the fact that they are so much more intelligent, because of the fact that they are so much more in touch with the Earth and, and all of this stuff, that they're able to move at this faster pace, right? Except that they seem to stagnate at some point. <laughs> Because the same exact technology that they have when they attack Arthur twenty some odd years later is is the same technology, so they it's like they advance, 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 and then they don't seem to get any better throughout the rest of the movie. And that just didn't that just didn't seem to when they showed back up later and they were in the same shit from before. It it visibly stood out to me that I was like, oh, they haven't done anything with their with their technology in the last 25 years like what what have, what have they been doing well, <laughs> like, it, was, I think so that, it was really weird that's i think a big problem is i don't think atlantis has advanced since they went underwater like i think that's the thing is that like they felt they were so far ahead of humanity uh-huh. that they then coast on these fucking coattails like well, yeah like they had uh-huh. to have developed the reverse scuba suit so that they can go on on land, the people who are not highborn, but like well, once no, you have so we it, know that they and we know they are making some advancements because he gives him the quote unquote he gives black um, Orm gives Black Manta the quote unquote latest technology. Like he says that he says this is the latest thing we like that we've created, and and so like they're clearly working on stuff. It's just it seemed weird that they didn't advance at all in the twenty some odd years that it takes for for Arthur to grow up. Is that, that like? Yeah, you're like, not wrong. You're 100 percent correct. There's just it. You know what it is? Is it very much felt like these are the toys? With this is the part of the movie where we sell you the toys. <laughs> when As those dudes someone showed who up. has all the Aquaman toys, yeah, those guys don't have toys. That's, that's dumb. The, that's the disappointing part about that's it. That's insane. The toys for the Aquaman are the... Aquaman, Mera, Orm, and Black Manta, and they like, build one of the trench guys. Oh That's it. It doesn't. I haven't even opened them yet because, like, I was excited to get them. I got them as Christmas and birthday gifts, but then I'm like, eh, 
don't know if I need to open you. <laughs> yeah, like, I'd I, like, to have you, but the Seven Kingdoms thing. I, how much of that is straight out of DC lore? Like, I couldn't tell you. I know that the trenches thing, you. but like, and the creature of the trenches is a thing. But like, the really weird crustacean the kingdom, kingdom and fish and fish kingdom and the fishermen. <laughs> yeah, I like. Those both I, sound made up for the movie. Yeah. So like, does I Zebel. Get him, because but, um... Dale and I were having this conversation where Mera has the Atlantean symbol on her belt and mm. her crown has the Atlantean symbol on it. And it's like, well, yeah, because she's an Atlantean in the comics. <laughs> she's not from another kingdom. I didn't even think about the fact that they said that there's a whole other kingdom that yeah. Dolph Lundgren's in charge Zebel. of. Zebel is the name of that kingdom. And Jesus. it's like, Mera is very clearly an Atlantean. Like, that's oh, like a God. big thing about it. Oh, God. See, okay. So this is what comes down to for me, is I think there is a lot of really cool thought behind some of the stuff in, in Aquaman, but I don't think it's very deep thought. And I think that's a, that is a product of, of Snyder and his entire style of filmmaking. I don't think that, the, I don't think DC's gotten away from that yet. I don't they think DC kind will of, ever get away from it. I, I, they, I think they did a pretty good job of taking the right steps with Wonder Woman. There is so much that they go into in in, in exposition with Wonder Woman that it, that straight up the first 45 minutes of that movie takes place, it, you know, it, with her in, in, as a child. Like, like there is – there so there's like this idea of it in Wonder Woman. I just don't think it goes far enough because it's a pretty, it's a pretty shallow movie other, otherwise, right? Like is, as much as I love that movie, I can totally admit that. I just think that this movie, I don't want to say it was a step back, but it definitely was at the very most a move sideways. Like, well, I don't think that, I don't think yeah, it gotten... doesn't push the envelope yeah. as forward as everybody's saying. Yeah. Um, I think that it's a better superhero movie, if that makes sense. Like DC's finally understanding that like part of the fun of the Marvel movies is that they are like a genre, right? Like Ant-Man mm -hmm. is very clearly a heist movie, but right. it's a heist movie with superheroes where like yeah. wonder woman as and i like wonder woman don't get me wrong it feels like a war movie through and through like it never really feels like a superhero film even sure. in the end where he like he reveals himself it's like all right this is just a war movie and sure. like justice league feels like armageddon or deep impact yeah yeah it doesn't and, and, like, feel and... like <laughs> And I get that, but I think that I personally would rather have Wonder Woman putting itself up as a war movie first and never quite getting to superhero movie status. I think I much more would prefer that than this movie, which couldn't decide what kind of movie it wanted to be, and in the end settled on the fact that, well, in the end it's a superhero movie, so let's just do whatever we want. Which then just makes it feel super incoherent. Right. Because other than a superhero movie, what is the genre of Aquaman? Exactly. It's strange that for a movie that takes place so deep in the ocean, it's such a shallow plot. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm so <laughs> proud of it. And mostly yeah. because it just came to me. And it's like, not like I've been sitting I, here waiting. No, it happened just now. And I'll give do it, you know, I'll give credit where it's due. Like I said earlier, there's definitely there's these echoes of Thor and there's de and there's tons of that with the Atlantis stuff, right? And and so like there's definitely moments where it feels like it is this like Shakespearean uh, old world god story, you know, like that Matt and that stuff is really good, except that suddenly then in the middle of it it becomes fucking Jewel of the Nile, right? Like like <laughs> it turns into honestly, it made me wish that there would be a new mummy franchise with Jason Momoa in the lead. I was watching the, the all of the desert scenes and I was like yeah, I could totally get behind a new mummy with him in it. Like, that would be amazing. <laughs> if you were fighting and, Tom Cruise's mummy, like, uh, they'd still need a Rick character if they were yeah. going to continue those. Yeah, and Jason yeah, yeah. Momoa would be awesome right. as, like, but then the guy the last, who fights the mummy. Right, but then the last third, out of nowhere, it becomes this, like, epic Lord of the Rings Peter Jackson movie, and I'm just like, that means fucking I was not nothing. prepared for that it. That literally means fucking nothing. Because, like, the the most important line in that whole fight is the fisherman princess going, he commands the trench, and Dolph Lundgren going, impossible. And it's like, that's the only line of dialogue in anything that has happened in the last 20 minutes that means anything. 
when he shows up with trident in hand and a fucking elder god beneath him, that should be the moment where all of the fighting stops and everybody takes a moment to figure out what the hell just happened. And instead, they're just like, no, forget it. Well, wait a minute. Don't forget it. Everything that you've been fighting for has completely changed here. And that happens so often where they just out of nowhere, they're just like, fuck it. We're moving forward. And nowhere is that more apparent than after the scene when you see um, the escape from uh, from the, the circle of fire. Right. And, and Arthur and Mara get away. And they fake their death and then jump inside a whale. And then they show, you know, everybody shows up, Orm and his gang show up and they see it. And not even two minutes later, we see Orm is tracking her. And he's just like, well, wait a minute. So then what was the, like, he's just like, no, I've been tracking her all along. And it's just like, wasn't, but why did we, like, you, it, 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 basically the movie constantly takes the wind out of its own sails. Something happens that completely changes the stakes and the plot, but nobody in the movie acknowledges it. And it's just like, well, wait, no, like, we need to take a second here and be like, wait a minute, this changes everything about your relationship with Mera. This changes everything about uh, w what the heroes think they're doing and getting away with versus what they're actually getting away with. Like, it doesn't change the stakes at all for them, despite the fact that it does change the stakes entirely for them. It's very, very weird. Yeah, and, and, it like, just, and it's just yeah. like, they're tracking you. Oh, broken. And then she, and then she figures like... out exactly what it is and breaks it. So then it's gone. It's, it's As quickly as it showed up, it's gone. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, I still like it. I can't, like, even though all this, I like it. And... I think that's good. Do you have any other final thoughts on Aquaman? Because I feel like we're just kind of going in circles. Good oh, no, circles. Strong go circles. But No, I, I will go back and I will say that I, I, I am looking forward to the idea of an Aquaman 2. I am very interested to see where they go with Aquaman. I'm very interested to see where they go with the DC Universe. And there clearly will be an Aquaman 2 because it, it, it passed the billion dollar mark. It, it dethroned the Dark Knight. So as far as Warner Brothers is concerned it's in the financial department, they need to make an Aquaman 2. You know, just like they needed to make an Aquaman a Wonder Woman too. Just no matter what happened with with Justice League and all that stuff, like they they um they've got some work uh, ahead of them. But I I'm in. Like they have my ticket. Yeah, me too. I don't know if they have my ticket for Shazam yet. And I also think it's weird that we're gonna have two Captain Marvel movies out within two weeks of each other. Uh, I, I we, they're not even gonna call them Captain Marvel anymore, right? No, like, I know that, but like. Well, it, no, you're, it doesn't you're not change the fact that he was Captain Marvel for most of my life. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, I made that joke with Dale. She didn't know what I was talking about. Because Captain Marvel has always been Shazam to her. Mm -hmm. And Captain Marvel has been Captain Marvel. But, like, it is super strange that these two characters, who have existed for, like, a, a, a substantial amount of time, <laughs> uh are finally coming to the big screen within two weeks of one another. Yeah. And I got to tell you right now, as we've just spent about an hour talking about superhero films, I don't know how I feel about either one of them. Oh, I'm super excited for Captain Marvel. Uh, Shazam, I'm going to see because I love Zachary Levy. But I'll be honest, that is the only thing that has me excited about that movie right now, is I can't wait to see Zachary Levy on the big screen in not a squeakle. Uh, but the squeakle's the second best Chip and Dale movie. Yeah, Chip and Dale. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's... Oh, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no I, man, I, it, you're it, not it, wrong. It will be exciting to see him in something. It's just... Captain yeah. Marvel is important to me because of what it's going to do to the Marvel Universe. So, like, I am looking forward to it because I do think it is going to change everything. I mean, Kevin Feige has come out and said that from here on out, she is going to be the center of what they do. So, like... I need to see it because it's going to dictate what the next 10 years of my life is going to be, you know, whereas Shazam, I want to see it because I'm just curious. Like, I don't think it's going to change anything about the way that I do things. I don't. Uh, yeah, that's that's true. I guess that's the thing, though, is that like they've put su such pressure on Captain Marvel. And then oh, yeah. from what I've seen, I'm just like, um, this is not doing it for me yet, guys. <laughs> like, yeah, no, and they, it's also it's, strange that it's like it for sure. it's a character that I have known for a long time but like with a cognitive brain like it's not like the x-men who when they came on the scene for me was with the cartoon in the 90s and my idea of what the x-men are is very different from what the x-men were up to that point captain right. marvel is a character that like i've known about most of my life and already knowing about superheroes when i found out about captain marvel 
Sure. So it's it's just strange in that way. Like in a weird way, Shazam still hit me in a point where like I was learning about superheroes. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Where Captain Marvel is like, no, I know superheroes, and I get this one story. Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, yeah. it's it's strange. I mean, like, I want it to be good. I'm I'm not not going to see it, but from everything that I've seen, there's nothing that's got me excited yet, and that makes me a little bit nervous. Also, the return of Phil Coulson. That I mean, like, there's so much about that movie that has me instantly hooked. <laughs> so. Well, we'll see. Yeah. Um, I really, there's another thing I wanted to talk about, but we're way past that limit. But the reason why I didn't bring it up is I wanted to make sure Seedrum was prepared. A bunch of shows I was excited about coming back have come back. <laughs> we're three episodes into second season of Orville. We're one episode into Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, we're going to talk about those next week. TV. So Seedrum has a chance to like. See at least one episode of both of those. But we did need to talk about Aquaman. Yeah, we needed to talk about Aquaman. Um, But here's the other thing, right? Because it is time for an ending. Murphy Brown is over. And -hmm. over the weekend, I watched the remaining episodes. Mm -hmm. And I just want to go on record as saying I don't think it tarnishes the legacy. And I don't think that the reboot was as bad as people are making it out to have been. So if you have the opportunity, watch it. The problem is that the world is a lot fucking different. Yeah. From the 90s. So, yeah. like, it's a lot harder to be as glib as they were during the original 10 seasons of Murphy Brown. Yeah. That's just the way it is. No, I I, I personally loved the reboot. So, I, I've got, I, you know. <laughs> oh, no I loved it too. Either. I absolutely loved it. And it's just like, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. It's scary the things that they shine the light on. Mm hmm. Because that's what's happening in the world today. But we'll have time for that next time. So if you want to make sure you're prepared for next episode, uh, catch an episode of Orville Season 2, catch an episode of Brooklyn Nine-Nine Season 6, any other shows, Seijin, that you care about that just recently came back? No, I'll just I'll put the reminder out about Brooklyn that uh, if you're looking for it through the Fox app or if you're looking through it because you were recording it on Fox, remember that it's not on Fox no more. It's NBC. It um, is NBC. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So if you want to yell at me about the fact that I liked the Murphy Brown remake or that I've been telling people to go see Aquaman but that had a lot of criticism for it, I am available on Twitter at Devin D. Decker. Um, and you can actually find a couple of tweets that I did about Aquaman while I was watching it because I was having such a hard time <laughs> maintaining focus on that movie that I decided tweeting about it would actually help. Um, and you can find that on my Twitter at Siege vs. the World. And the hashtag I put on it was uh, hashtag Aquaman and then hashtag look how invested I am. Such a prick. I saw the first one and I'm like, it doesn't look like you're invested at all. You <laughs> all right. But until next time, William. Take us home for the 104th time. Thank you for listening to the Say Report with your host Devin Decker and Seedon Serwick. Please follow the guys on Twitter and Facebook by searching for The Say Report. And you can always subscribe on your podcast channel so this is delivered straight to you and you can enjoy it every week. With apologies to your mother, we'll see you next time.